Disney World can be magical, but there are definitely mistakes that can turn your happily ever after into a terrible trip. Today, we're going to make sure your upcoming Disney World vacation will keep a hold of the magic and avoid the tragic. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog. We are ready to fix your Disney World vacation before it even starts. So here's how today's gonna go down. We're gathering up the top concerns that we've heard straight from you about what's going on at Disney World right now. That way we can address them head on here and hopefully put those worries and anxieties to rest before your trip to the most magical place on earth. The first one we're going to talk about is getting to Disney World too late. Now, it's not Disney's fault if you get stuck in hours worth of traffic during your car trip or your flight's delayed, but that doesn't mean these unexpected time sucks aren't going to start your best vacation ever off on a sour note. That's why you're going to need to, as we say, plan for the worst but anticipate the best because you never know what delays might come to bite you. When you're driving, make sure to give yourself one or two extra travel days on the road, especially if you're making a really long trek that's going to take multiple days before you get to the Orlando. Orlando area. Now, Bria and I both, now Bria's my script writer for those of you who are new to DFB, we both used to take those long, long, long 20, 24 hour road trips to Disney World when we were kids with our families. And she says that it was always a long trip, but it was longer when they ran into that Atlanta traffic in Georgia. So they'd always book their Disney World resort with three full days of travel in mind. And then if they somehow got there earlier, they would stay in kind of a good neighbor hotel the first night night and then get up bright and early the next day and head over to Disney World. Now, planning extra travel days on the road is also a good idea if you're traveling with kids in tow, so you can plan for more frequent pit stops for everyone to shake their sillies out. When it comes to flights, however, make sure you got your airlines app downloaded ahead of time so you can keep track of your flight status. That way you can start making adjustments and rearrangements just as soon as you learn about any potential delays that'll bump back your trip by a whole lot. In some cases, if your flight's delay is going to be hours later than originally, scheduled, which would cause you to miss your connecting flight or even a whole day later than you were expecting, where you're going to be forced to get a hotel room for the night if you decide to stick it out. Then you'll need to go up to the front desk of the airline or your flight's gate or call the airline or whatever and get things sorted out. Flight personnel should be on hand to help, so make sure to let them know as calmly and coolly as possible about your dilemma, and they should be able to rebook you for a different flight or even compensate you so you can rebook an earlier flight for a different airline. All depends on the situation, but the help desk should be able to walk you through your different options. Now, many of us have been in this situation and we've also been in the two hour long line that everybody on your airplane is in line to talk to someone at the flight desk, right? So what I would do in that case or what I always do in that case when it happens to me is I call the airline right when I'm on the plane. If I'm on the plane, and I know that the flight is going to be severely delayed or I'm not going to make my connecting flight, I will call the airline from the plane or I will get in touch with them over the app and figure out if I can make a change right there. A lot of airline apps now, you are able to actually make flight changes just via the app. So that might also be a good plan. That's something that I've done as well. So I don't have to wait in those endless lines. Now, as far as your Disney hotel room reservation is concerned, and I know we're spending a lot of time on this point, but this is something that can really mess with your trip. And so I just want to make sure that we've got all our bases covered here for you. Now, as far as your Disney hotel room reservations are concerned, these can be modified depending on the type of room you have. If you have a room that is a room only, that can be modified currently up to five days in advance. Soon that'll bump to eight days in advance. And if you've got a package, I think all of that has to be managed differently. But if you're going to have an issue, if you're going to be a day late to your reservation, be sure to call, call, call. Don't try to do it online. Don't try to modify it via the app. Just call them and let them know the circumstances and the situation so that they can make the changes directly so you're not having to sort of worry. Because usually if you're trying to make that reservation change online and you're just like a day out from your trip, it's you're going to have to call anyway. So just call Disney and see if you can make that reservation update and get that sorted out. 
Now, Disney World is home to over 400 restaurants, and for many of those restaurants, you'll want to make advanced dining reservations to guarantee your seat the day of your visit, especially for the most popular restaurants like Cinderella's Royal Table in Magic Kingdom, Space 220 in Epcot, Hollywood Brown Derby in the studios, Chef Mickey's at the Contemporary Resort, plus a bunch of others. Now, you can start making dining reservations 60 days before your trip through the My Disney Experience app or on the Disney World website. And making reservations isn't hard, it's just making sure you don't miss out on your reservation window before everyone else swoops in to snag all the seats. You see, reservations can be made anytime after that 60 days window pops up. But ADRs are a lot like, I don't know, when McDonald's had those weird adult Happy Meal toys for sale, those toys were supposed to be available for the remainder of the month, but when everyone's going to the drive throughs grabbing them all up in the first few days of their release, then you're going to be left without an adult Happy Meal toy, even if you show up when the sign advertising them is still posted in the window. I know, this is very relatable content. Anyway, fortunately, Disney World has recently made searching for ADRs a lot easier. You can now search table service availability for multiple days at once. This is a godsend. We have been wanting this for years. Now to use this new feature, you're going to start by looking for reservations per usual. So you'll tap the plus button on the My Disney Experience home screen and select check dining availability. From there, you can choose your party size, your start date and time. And once the screen loads, you'll notice a new check availability for multiple days button beneath each restaurant. If you press that button, it'll direct you to the restaurant's individual reservation page where you can now select your specific date ranges. The calendar is going to show all the dining reservation days that are still available for your selected restaurant 60 days out instead of just showing them to you one day at a time. This is going to save us so much time, y'all. I'm so happy about this. So if the restaurant you want is not available during the specific date or time range, you can always modify your park days to fit your desired dining reservations. Now, What have I always said? You should build your Disney trip around your restaurants, right? And that's exactly what we're doing. Now, don't forget, you can always check the My Disney Experience app and see if there are any walk-up lists or day of reservations available for restaurants on the day of your park visit too. While last minute availability isn't always guaranteed, guests do have to make sudden cancellations frequently, giving you the chance to swoop in and grab that seat in the nick of time. I personally have had a lot of luck getting very popular restaurants on the day of, and it seems to be happening more often now than it has in the past. So heads up, definitely use that last minute check. Okay, this next one is one that's near and dear to my heart because I've done this many times and Disney has always been great with it, and that's losing stuff when you're at the parks. There is this sheer panic that washes over you when you lose something important like a wallet or a phone that'll absolutely bring your fun-filled vacation to a screeching halt. Fortunately, Disney has a really robust lost and found system, but the first thing you need to do when you've lost something is retrace your steps. Go back to where you think you lost it and talk to a cast member nearby. Sometimes cast members will hold on to lost items for a short period of time before sending them on to guest relations or lost and found. If it's been a few hours since you lost your item or if cast members haven't recovered your item yet, you'll want to go to the nearest guest experience location. So look for those blue umbrellas or find the location on your My Disney Experience app. You can also visit the main guest relations area near the entrance of the park. Now, Disney's Lost and Found is huge, so there is an extensive system that documents each lost item. And while that's great for keeping things organized and improving the chances of folks actually being reunited with their stuff, it does mean your lost item might be found but still needs to be cataloged, so it could take a couple more days before your item is actually returned to you. It's best if you can report whatever you've lost as quickly as possible on chargerback.com, that's Disney's online lost and found page. Fill out the form to report your missing item and Disney will keep you updated on the status of their search. Even if they find it after your trip's already ended, Disney will typically mail your item to your house at no extra cost. And it'll be the happily ever after reunion you were hoping for. Now, those of you been listening to these videos for a long time or watching these videos for a long time know that I left my phone in a minivan once and thankfully I got that back after going to guest relations and they kind of called the minivan folks and we got it sorted out and I've also left basically an entire closet of clothing in a Disney hotel before and 
somehow they got it all and it was all returned to me and it was really i was so grateful because this is stuff that i can't buy again and i wear it all the time so i was really happy about that now as much as i wish i could tell you that this always happens and everything always ends happily that'd be a lie not everyone out there is as nice as you and me and someone could pick up your stuff and decide to keep it for themselves instead of handing it over to a cast member which is super lame there's no way of getting around what a major bummer that is but your next best steps now are to make sure your information and identity is protected. Call your bank, have them shut off your card that was in your wallet, contact your phone provider, disconnect your cell service, and look online to find solutions that you're comfortable with to sign up for when it comes to identity protection. Again, this is all extreme, and we sure hope that families out on a Disney vacation are kind and sweet and help one another out, but just in case there's a bad apple in the bunch, we don't want anything to further happen to your information if it falls into the wrong hands. So be proactive, make sure that if you can't use your stuff, then nobody can. Disney World's complimentary transportation services don't just get you from point A to point B. They get you to an experience, too. Even the Disney buses have their charm, all wrapped up in fun character designs while telling you to sit back and relax, you'll be home soon. But it is important to understand how Disney's buses are going to get you to different parts of the hotels and resorts, and it's especially important to understand the hours that bus transportation is available. We do not want you getting stranded somewhere on property, and buses run at different frequencies depending on the day and the time. So let's break it down. Disney bus transportation is offered at each Disney hotel and for all four theme parks, both water parks and Disney Springs. Easy to remember so far, right? But even though buses are available at all of these places, that doesn't mean you'll always have a direct connection to where you need to go next. For example, Disney's Polynesian Village Resort is going to run buses to Disney Springs, Hollywood Studios, Animal Kingdom, and the water parks. But this resort does not run buses to Magic Kingdom or or Epcot since it's got the monorail handy. Buses also don't run between resorts, so if you're staying at Disney's All-Star Music, but you have a dining reservation for Boma and Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge, you're either going to have to take a bus to Disney Springs and then to one of the parks and take connecting resort buses from there, or purchase a ride share, or drive yourself on over to the next resort. And what's wild about that is that All-Star Music is very, very close to Disney's Animal Kingdom Lodge, so if you actually take a bus to Springs or a bus to Animal Kingdom and then a bus all-star music that's going to take you at least an hour when if you drove that distance it would take about four minutes there are also times when locations will run buses when they don't normally have bus service like for instance if you're staying at one of the skyliner resorts and the skyliner has to shut down due to weather then disney will make sure to deploy buses to these locations to get you back home safe sound and semi-dry Now, if you're traveling to a theme park by bus, the buses normally operate 45 minutes before a theme park's opening time and stop running one hour after a theme park's closing time. But sometimes those buses will run less frequently mid-morning because they figure they've gotten everybody to the theme parks and there aren't too many people coming back from the theme parks at like 10 a.m. So they're going to run them a little bit less often. And that can catch you off guard too, especially if you're someone like me who likes to go in for early theme park entry and ride a bunch of stuff and then head home and get to the hotel pool by 11 o'clock. Now, as for Disney Springs, buses are going to start running each morning around 9 a.m. and will keep running until 12.30 a.m., but the service to the theme parks is not offered at Disney Springs, so don't come to the shopping district thinking you can browse around for a bit in the morning and then hitch a ride over to Epcot. You're going to have to, as they say, take the long way around. Now, park hours vary each day, so it's extremely important to make sure you download the My Disney Experience app so you can stay in the know when it comes to bus availability. And if you do happen to miss your Disney bus ride, don't worry, you aren't going to be stranded. Rideshare services like Lyft and Uber are available 24-7. You'll just have to pay to use those. And cast members are going to be in the parks and at the resorts, and they can absolutely help you. If you are stuck and you have no way to get back to your hotel from the Magic Kingdom after it closes, a cast member will figure out how to get you home. But overall, Disney buses are incredibly useful. They are usually available when you need them, but things can definitely shift and change. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten out of a park late and those buses have stopped running or I parked my car in the Epcot parking lot and then I hopped to Hollywood Studios. And once Hollywood Studios closed, I couldn't get back into Epcot to get to my car. This happens all the time. So just think through your transportation plan for the day and make sure it all makes sense. 
All right, time to talk closures. Nobody wants to hear that the Disney ride or show or attraction they were most looking forward to seeing will be closed when they're on their trip and maybe even forever after that. But it happens. Sometimes closures happen for maintenance reasons, sometimes for weather-related stuff, sometimes for seasonal renovations, and sometimes when it's being transformed into something else completely. So here are some of the latest closures you might run into if you're planning or visiting the parks in the near future. Splash Mountain is, as of January 23rd of last year, closed permanently. The ride is now being transformed into a Princess and the Frog-themed attraction called Tiana's Bayou Adventure, which is slated to open in summer 2024. In that same Frontierland area, Country Bear Jamboree is also closed, but will reopen this summer too, this time as the Country Bear Musical Jamboree, so get ready to see these beloved bears take on a whole new act. Frozen Ever After is going to be closed for a short duration starting on November 2nd, 2024 for maintenance purposes, but is expected to reopen again on November 7th, 2024. In Hollywood Studios, the Voyage of the Little Mermaid stage show has officially closed to start making way for the revamped version, The Little Mermaid, A Musical Adventure, which should be showing some time this fall. Meanwhile, Rock and Roller Coaster, also in Hollywood Studios, closed back in January but is anticipating to reopen this summer. And Disney's Blizzard Beach Water Park is now closed for its routine maintenance, meaning Typhoon Lagoon is back up and running again, since both water parks never stay open together nowadays. Sure, these closures are going to give you more of a heads up before your trip, but what happens if you run into a ride or attraction closure the day of your visit due to technical difficulties or storms in the area? First, ask a cast member how long the ride's been down, as well as if they expect it to come back up and running soon. They won't be able to give you an exact reopening time frame, but they can let you know if the situation is more of a quick remedy rather than an extensive one, so you don't waste your valuable park time vulture circling a nearby area for a ride that's not going to be fixed anytime soon. If it is going to take a while for a ride to go back online again, if it ever does, then start to rework your plans for the day. Check on the current ride wait times via your My Disney Experience app and see what you can reprioritize at the moment. You can also use this waiting period to hit up some of the park's underrated gems like Muppet Vision 3D in Hollywood Studios or Grand Fiesta Tour starring the Three Caballeros in Epcot or Carousel of Progress in Magic Kingdom or even the Wildlife Express Train in Animal Kingdom. You know, things like that where the waits are consistently pretty low. That way, whether the temporarily unavailable attraction ever goes back online for you or not, you've still managed to fill your day to the brim with lots of fun Disney experiences, so your day doesn't have to entirely center around the fact that you missed out on something. Now, sometimes the reason we end up missing out on a ride isn't because it's down for maintenance or weather-related purposes. Sometimes we miss out on it because we miss getting in line for it altogether. There are two attractions at Disney World currently that you can't just get in a standby line for, and that's Tron, Light Cycle Run in Magic Kingdom, and Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind in Epcot. We're also assuming that once Tiana's Bayou Adventure opens over in Magic Kingdom this summer, it may not open with a regular standby line either. Instead, in order to ride these rides, you're going to need to secure your spot in a virtual queue or purchase an individual lightning lane. Now, virtual queues are free reservations that allow you to join the standby line for the newest Disney rides through your My Disney Experience app without having to purchase an individual lightning lane to ride them, though you could choose an individual lightning lane route if you don't want to deal with the virtual queue hassle. There are certain times of the day when the virtual queues open on the My Disney Experience app. Once at 7 a.m., once at 1 p.m. Sometimes there's an extra one at 6 p.m. if there's an extended evening hours. Now, if you get a boarding group number during either time that the virtual queues go live, then all you'll have to do now is wait for your boarding group number to be called during your park day. That means you can do other things around the parks like munch on snacks or watch shows or ride a bunch of other rides while you wait in line virtually. Once you get that notification that your boarding group group is up and it's ready for you to ride, you'll be notified on the My Disney Experience app with a time window for arrival. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that boarding group numbers get snatched up fast, and that means you could end up paying all this money for a park ticket and still not be able to ride the newest attraction in the park. This happened all the time back when Rise of the Resistance opened with that virtual queue. I would see people on the Skyliner heading into Hollywood Studios at like 1 p.m., all excited to ride Rise of the Resistance, and I knew there was no way they were going to get on Rise of the Resistance. All of those rides had already been spoken for at 7 a.m. and 1 p.m., and those 
folks were not going to be able to ride that ride. And it broke my heart and it continues to break my heart when I hear about people who don't know about the virtual queue system and are going to walk into Epcot thinking they're going to get in line for Cosmic Rewind and aren't aren't worried if they have to wait a few hours to ride it and they're not going to get to ride it at all. And it's so frustrating. But the good news is you know about the virtual queues. You're going to get into them. And now that Park Pass reservations are a thing of the past for most guests, if you don't get into one of the virtual queues, you can try for the other one now. You didn't used to be able to do that because you could only go to one park per day and then you couldn't hop until 2 p.m. Now, if you don't get into the Cosmic Rewind queue, you can try immediately for the Tron queue. So essentially, you've got two chances to get a virtual queue instead of one. Just keep in mind that you can't hold two virtual queues at once. So if you get that Cosmic Rewind boarding group, you can't go get a Tron one for the same time frame. You'll just have to ride Cosmic Rewind hopefully in the morning, and then you can head over and try for Tron for the 1 p.m. drop. Now, if all of that was confusing to you, you might be... (laughs) the perfect person to buy an individual lightning lane just to guarantee your time slot for the ride. Some folks also use their deluxe resort privileges for that third chance at getting a virtual queue spot right before the extended evening hours at 6 p.m. Now here's one more way to kind of buck the system. It's always worth looking into the park's after hours events if you want to skip over all the virtual queue and individual lightning lane stress entirely. After hours events are separate park ticket options on select nights that give you three extra hours in the parks after they close for the public. This is different from extended evening hours, which are just for deluxe resort guests and are free for deluxe resort guests. The after hours events can be booked by anybody, but they will cost you extra. Now this gives you extra time to ride all the rides without the extra crowds and the wait times and also you can stock up on complimentary treats like mickey ice cream bars and popcorn and soda as much as you want now these after hours events can be pricey but because their tickets are capped off to make capacity much more limited than normal park hours you will not have to worry about getting in a virtual queue for these hot ticket rides and you'll probably be able to ride them multiple times while you're there that night. Now, we're not sure if this will be the case for Tiana's Bayou Adventure 2, but we'll let you know just as soon as we learn more if that's kind of added to the after hours event lineup. At either rate, virtual queues are so important to learn about before your visit. Make sure to study up on them ahead of time by downloading the My Disney Experience app right away and by checking out our virtual queues page on the DFB website so you're not blindsided by their importance during your park day. So was anyone else's social media getting flooded with the massive spring break crowds that were happening at Disney World this year? The fact that it was taking people so long to travel between pavilions and Epcot's World Showcase was wild. So how can you deal with the peak vacation season crowds in Disney World and still have a great time seeing all the attractions? Well, again, I gotta recommend the After Hours events. Seriously, y'all, those can be major time savers and help you accomplish all the rides without waiting hours on end for the bulk of them. But if you don't go that extra hours route, Disney Genie Plus can still be a nifty line bypassing tool whether we like it or not. I know paying upwards of $39 per person for Genie Plus access during those peak season times is not ideal. But let's be real. If you're going to Disney World during the busiest times of the year, then not investing in Genie Plus could actually be more of a money waster in the end. You're already paying for all these park tickets and flights and hotel rooms and meals. You don't want to do all that only to spend the majority of your day waiting in shoulder to shoulder lines. That's just as miserable as it is expensive. And time is money in Disney World. So the more time you spend in line and not doing other things, the more money you're wasting. Again, is it an ideal situation? No. But when your only Disney vacation option lands during those peak season times, you got to prepare yourself for the crowds as best you possibly can. And that means you might have to put back a little extra money for those lightning lane advantages. Okay, I could go off on a tangent right now about all the different strategies to get the best out of your Genie Plus buck, but we've already got videos all about that for each park on our DFE channel. So instead, I'm going to show you exactly what we did, specifically during our last Disney World visit, to use our lightning lanes in a way that made the most sense for our trip. And maybe those same strategies will help you as you figure out your specific park schedules too. For this day, we park hopped between Animal Kingdom and Hollywood Studios, which ended up working in our favor to the max. Step one, we purchased the the multi-park option for Disney Genie Plus. This is the most expensive option, but will be the one you've got to use if you're going to be using a park hopper. Oh, and I guess that was step a half. Make sure you have park hopper tickets. 
Step two, we booked Slinky Dog Dash immediately. The assigned return time for us, even when we grabbed our lightning lane at 7 a.m., was already 3 to 4 p.m., which just goes to show you how quickly that specific lightning lane books up. Step three, we went to Animal Kingdom right at Rope Drop. I know we booked that Slinky Dog Dash lightning lane, but the return time wasn't until way later on in the day. That means we were still able to knock out the rides in Animal Kingdom and stack lightning lanes for Hollywood Studios at the same time. You'll see what I mean by that in just a second. Step four, we purchased an individual lightning lane for Rise of the Resistance. We weren't staying at a Disney World Resort during this last trip, so we had to purchase a Rise individual lightning lane once the park opened. Unlike lightning lanes featured on Genie Plus, we were able to make a return time selection for our individual lightning lane, so we chose around 5 to 6 p.m. But let me say this, staying at a Disney resort can really help you get a head start to these busy days, not just because you get to book individual lightning lanes first, because heads up, those can and do sell out in that 7 to 8 a.m. hour, but also because you get to use the early theme park entry benefit for each park on every day, giving you 30 extra minutes inside the parks before they open for everyone else. Just something to keep in mind. Step five, head to Flight of Passage first. The line was still super long for this one, even at the start of the day, but it only got longer towards midday and you know right after noon. Now you can always book an individual lightning lane for Flight of Passage 2 since you're allowed to hold two individual lightning lanes per day, but we just cut our losses there and decided to wait things out. After all, the Flight of Passage queue is at least stunning and has a bathroom midway through. Step six, as soon as two hours had passed since the park's opening, we made another lightning lane selection for Tower of Terror. This is where stacking comes into play. Sure, we hadn't used our Slinky Dog Dash Lightning Lane yet, but that wasn't going to happen until 3 p.m. While you can always book a new Lightning Lane right after you've used your last one, the My Disney Experience app will also let you book a new Lightning Lane after a two-hour kind of cool-down period has passed since the last one you booked. That way, you can get as many Lightning Lanes as possible in a single day. If you're confused about when you'll be eligible to book your next lightning lane, just check the top of the Genie Plus screen and it'll let you know. Step seven, we kept this pattern going. We hopped in line for the Animal Kingdom rides, kept booking lightning lanes for Hollywood Studios attractions, and then by the time we were ready to hop into Hollywood, we had already collected like four lightning lanes that were ready to be used back to back. Genie Plus can be a lot to wrap your mind around, but that's why we've created that free Disney Genie Plus cheat sheet for you to refer back to even when you're in the park. You can grab that now by scanning the QR code you see here or by heading to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney Genie Plus right after this. Okay, we're friends, right? Like we're good friends, buddies? Then let's be honest here. The bathroom problems you can encounter in the Disney World parks can be very unmagical. Not only are they painful, but they can come quick and can be super embarrassing to deal with when you're in a group that doesn't quite know how to help you out here. With that being said, let's talk about how to survive the poop problems in Disney World. Yep, I said it, the P word. Remember, you said we were friends. Don't turn your back on me now. It's important to try and stick to your normal diet when you're in Disney World. Unfortunately, Disney doesn't make all their snacks out of faith, trust, and pixie dust. So if something upsets your stomach at home, chances are it'll do the exact same things in the parks. Also, try to remember to pack those meds or supplements in your park bag to help save the day if you're in a pinch. You can also find meds for sale in your Disney Resort gift shop, or you can find free sample sizes of over-the-counter meds at the first aid locations in the parks. Now, we always, always, always recommend staying on top of your hydration goal during your Disney days, but drinking plenty of water can also help in the bathroom department. Dehydration can lead to major stomach issues along with a ton of other ailments like those awful headaches, the heat exhaustion, other illnesses you'd probably rather not deal with while you're meeting Mickey Mouse or about to take a photo pass picture. So bring your own water bottle to the parks and set alarms if you need reminders to chug. I definitely had to do that back in 2020 when we had to wear masks in the parks and we couldn't eat or drink unless we kind of pulled the mask down to do it. You couldn't kind of walk around without a mask. And so it was just really hard to remember to to drink when you had that mask on. But you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Things are easier. So definitely drink up. And remember, you can also snag free cups of water at quick service restaurants and snack stands. Now, while you're upping your water intake, make sure you're simultaneously keeping track of what else you're drinking when you're in Disney World. Coffee's a big one you might want to err on the side of caution with, if you know what I mean. Now, the same can be said for overly sugary drinks or alcohol. Both can tend to add to dehydration, so if you're drinking anything but water, make sure you balance things out with a lot of H2O. Okay, but now let's get real personal here. How embarrassing is it to be having bathroom problems when you're sharing a hotel room with people? Like, those walls aren't thick, y'all. 
all. In fact, they're going to downright expose you in the worst possible ways. So this is when bathroom sprays like poo-pourri can be a lifesaver for everyone in the room. I always bring one with me, especially on cruise ships. It's also not a bad idea to have a little background noise going on for the sake of you and your group. Just saying it can help. Now, it's silly to talk about, I know, but it's not a laughing matter when this is something you have to consider when you're in Disney World. So just be ready and know where a nearby restroom is so you never have to get caught without one when things are starting to look rough. You can absolutely look those up on your My Disney Experience app. It'll show you where all the nearby bathrooms are. Also, believe me, you're not alone. A lot of us here at DFB, we talk about this a lot. (laughs) Now, it's time to talk about the main issue people have with Disney World year after year after year. Disney just keeps getting more and more expensive. We see it happen all the time. Price increases on food and merchandise, park tickets, nearly everything in between. It gets harder and harder every year to plan a budget for a future trip because you never know how prices are going to change. It's a big reason why many families have stopped planning trips to Disney World at all. It's no longer in their budget and just continues to get more impossible sounding by the minute. But money-saving tactics that could save your Disney World vacation budget? There are certain ways you can save not just some money, but a lot of money on your upcoming Disney World trip. I'm about to record a whole video right after this, actually, as soon as I'm done recording this one, (laughs) I'm going to record a whole video with a ton of great money saving tactics. We've got other videos on the channel that have a bunch of those as well. So definitely check those out and we've got more coming for you. But here are a couple tips just to keep in your back pocket here for this video. First, staying off Disney property. While even Disney's lower cost value hotel rooms can still cost you almost $200 per night, many of the nearby good neighbor hotels that partner with Disney could wind up being a lot less than $100 per night, depending on the time of year or what promotion offerings you might be able to add on. If you're looking for a hotel suite, good neighbor hotels might be the better way to go too, because Disney suites and multi-bedroom options tend to range between $600 and $1,500 plus per night. But many of the good neighbor hotel suites and multi-bedroom options may only cost you between two and $500 per night. Again, depending on which hotel you choose, what time of year you visit, and what discounts you can score. Don't forget to research Airbnbs and VRBOs too. While there's no Disney partnership going on with these accommodations, meaning you'll end up missing out on the Disney Resort perks, you'll be able to book full houses near-ish to the Disney parks with kitchens and multiple bathrooms, maybe even a private backyard pool for more moderate price points. Just make sure you do your research and check on reviews before you book. And of course, check Disney's current special offers, deals, and discounts page on their website. These deals are continuously being updated year round, and there's always going to be a discount on those hotels. Do not pay rack rate for your hotels in Disney World. Currently, you can find a specially priced three-day three-park ticket valid for admission in Hollywood Studios, Epcot, and Animal Kingdom that starts at $89 per day plus tax. That's a total price starting at $267 for all three days per person. Now, these are date-based tickets, so you'll need to start your first day's admission between April 2nd through September 24th, 2024, and all three days worth of tickets must be used within five days of your start date. Promotions like this and hotel promotions, like I mentioned before, are constantly being updated on the site. So make sure you go there first before locking in any big Disney World hotel or ticket or vacation package purchases. And another one that I'm going to be talking about a lot more in the next video that I'm recording, but I'm going to drop it here too in case this is the only video you watch happy hours. More often than not, it's happy hours somewhere in Disney Springs. Various spots in the Disney Springs shopping district, including House of Blues, Haleo, Jock Lindsay's, Raglan Road, offer special dining and drink deals during certain hours on certain days. These deals tend to switch up every so often, but you can find every specific deal going on right now via our 2024 DFB Guide to Walt Disney World Dining. That's over at dfbstore.com. Be sure to type in code YouTube for the extra guidebooks savings. And let me tell you, we have got so much information in that guide. So I hope, hope, hope you love it. Now, you know how earlier I mentioned that the foods that give you stomach problems back home are still going to give you stomach problems in Disney? Yeah, it's not magical. 
in that way. It's not going to completely change who you are as a person. And you take that same advice and apply it to your kids. If your kids need afternoon naps to get them through the day, they're going to need them in Disney. If they get overstimulated at Chuck E. Cheese, they're going to get overstimulated in Disney. If the 4th of July fireworks are too loud for them, like they were for me, my family had to drive to Canada every 4th of July for heaven's sake. I can't believe they did that for me. I have the best parents in the world. Then the happily ever after fireworks will be too loud for them. If they don't want to take pictures with Santa at the mall, they probably won't want to take pictures with Santa at Disney Springs. And if sugar makes them hyperactive, then watch out when they get their hands on a Mickey premium bar. So what I'm trying to say is the same kid you got back home is going to be the kid you're bringing to Disney World with you, no matter how many Dumbo rides and under the sea journeys they experience. So plan accordingly to make sure you're accommodating your kids' needs just as much as anyone else's. Otherwise, you might find all the noise and the heat, the lack of sleep. It's going to push them to their breaking point, which might lead to your breaking point. Now, let me just say this, even if you do factor in a balanced diet and plenty of naps into your family's day, your kid could still experience meltdown for whatever reason. Maybe their balloon flew away or Daisy Duck didn't stop to say hi to them or they're mad that they have to wait in line. Me too. If you take nothing else away from this video, please latch onto this. Your kiddo's meltdown does not make you a bad parent. Seriously, I know Disney World is a park made for everyone, but that doesn't mean it's not hard for everyone too, especially when you're racking up thousands of steps per day in the constant heat. Tears happen. It's okay. Don't let anyone make you feel like it's not okay. I've had to take my toddler out of many, many, many a Disney restaurant because he was just not going to get it together. And I wasn't going to do that to everybody else in the restaurant. So we just got up and left. I don't think I'm that bad a parent. It's just, it's just what happens when everybody's just overstimulated and exhausted and eating sugar all day. <sighs> it happens. So just remember that one or two or even multiple kiddo breakdowns don't mean your kid's not going to have a good time in Disney. You just need to prepare for plenty of breaks throughout the day. Get yourself in the AC, grab a snack and drink, maybe go over to the baby care centers. Give everyone time to cool off physically, emotionally, before you jump back into the park scene. And yeah, I just kind of hopped over the baby care centers though, but these are fantastic and all of the theme parks have them. They have a quiet, peaceful, private spot for parents to sneak in a quick diaper change or a nurse or pick up any baby necessities they might have forgotten to pack. These areas are also well stocked with formula, baby food, juice, diapers, wipes, clothing, and over-the-counter medications for purchase, making it the perfect spot for when you need to escape but don't want to backtrack all the way back to your hotel room to make it happen. So terrible situations might happen in Disney World. They've happened to all of us a million times, but they don't have to lead to a flat-out terrible vacation. Stick with us, we're gonna continue to show you how to navigate Disney World during the best of times and the worst of times. And be sure to pick up our free Disney Genie Plus cheat sheet over at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disney Genie Plus. Thanks for listening everyone and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog and we'll see you real soon.